What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I am Tony, and this is Mariana. We're cooped up in person in the Allo HQ over here in L.A. She just flew out, and we're having a great time with it, okay? Now, it's no secret, the fitness industry, the one we're in right now, sucks. Whether it's the corrupt multi-billion dollar supplement and weight loss industry, or the endless supply of influencers promoting anything to drive page views. The bottom line is we're not just trying to provide another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by providing you with the knowledge and tools to give you the confidence in applying the best possible training and nutrition into your own life. Where today we actually just sat down with one of our, I would say, good friends now, Ben Carpenter, with my most, I would rank this as my most enjoyed interview to date. I think my most enjoyed episode, probably. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 and we're not exaggerating here. It was, it was truly incredible. We got yeah. to sit down we chatted him. We showed him around this aloe place. We got a cool little ice plunge coming in. So uh, I'm chattering my teeth until about halfway through the episode. But uh, he, if you're unfamiliar with Ben, he gives us a really unique look because he's been in this industry for so long and really aligns with how we try and see things a little bit. We talk not only on like the research facet because he's one of the most evidence-based and consistent evidence-based trainers I think I've ever followed and had the pleasure of knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got into a real big topic of fitness versus health and really separating those two because so many people just use them interchangeably, defining what they actually mean and really defining where we want to go with that along with, I mean, we bubbled up probably 10 other things in this episode. Yeah, we talked about evidence-based nutrition, fitness, health recommendations, how to navigate social media if you are trying to lose weight or get any sort of health advice. We talked about motivation, self-confidence. A little philosophy a lot, too. A lot of stuff, and I, I loved it. I could listen to him talk forever, I think, and especially just his ability to take so many different perspectives. And, yeah, I just... Yeah, no, he, he's incredible. <laughs> he actually just came out with his book, Everything Fat Loss, which I know we've had for the last few weeks. It just launched less than a month ago. Uh, but he does an extraordinary well job, and I think you'll realize this just through listening to him, of filling out every dead end that your mind could possibly go to in explaining a topic because we know fitness and health is complex. Okay, It's not a simple, simple thing that so many people make it out to be, and he's one of the best in the world, I think, at describing, communicating why that is. So, but you'll get a pretty clear view of that. <laughs> just by listening to him, and we'll tell you where to find him after the show as well. But before we jump into it, as always, we just want to say thank you so much for everyone who's left a five-star review and taken the 10, 15 seconds it takes right now to jump over if you're listening on Spotify or Apple to go rate us there because that's really what's made this possible to spread to so many people. Why Mariana's sitting here next to me, she's real, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> instead of over a screen, right? <laughs> over the last like six, seven months as we've grown, that's really so much to do because of you guys. So seriously, thank you so much for taking that time because I know it's a little annoying, right? You might have to remember to do it after you, you park your car, whatever it is. But we <laughs> thank you so, so much. Yes. And as always, if you like the research aspect that we bring into each episode, make sure you join us on our premium membership in the Fitness Stuff Research Review, where we dive even deeper into specific studies, addressing individual nuances, showing you how to apply each aspect into your own daily life. And when you sign up, the first month is just $5, so it's 50% off. You also get access to our Ask Me Anything episodes, where each month we answer your questions. And it's a great time to get to know you guys a little bit more, answer things that maybe we can't dedicate a full episode to that you've been yearning to ask. And then also we have bonus um, benefits for our members, such as discounts on Merrick Health, getting your blood work done, um, Examine Plus, and much more. So make sure you go check that out. We will have the link in the description. And a little word from our sponsor, Legion Athletics. We love Legion. We can't talk about it enough if you're looking for protein, pre-workout, creatine. They got just about everything that evidence supports. Yes. They don't do BCAs. They don't do a lot of stuff that evidence doesn't, but anything you're looking to, that's what Mike Matthews mm -hmm. did. A great evidence-based company. They also have a great blog, a great resource if you're just trying to get the basics when it comes to training, nutrition, and it is one of the very few brands that dedicates a lot of their work to being evidence-based. Mm -hmm. So we highly recommend them. I know I'm always loving their protein. It's great as a shake. It's great for baking into things. They also have a plant protein option if you're looking for that. And for my lactose intolerant people, their whey protein isolate is separated from lactose, so it's lactose free. I know that could be a concern yeah. for some people. And yeah, you can get 20% off 
your first order or double points after that with code FSPOD. We will also have the link in the description of this episode. And this is a perfect time to introduce our newest sponsor. Now, if there's one thing that Marianne and I do not shut up about on this podcast, it is protein. And that's because whatever your goal is, whether it's to lose fat and lean out, to build muscle and get stronger, or even just live a higher quality, longer life, protein is always at the center of what you should probably be focusing on. Yeah. And I would say that one of the most commonly questions without a doubt that we both get asked very often is which type of protein should you be choosing? And there's so many different types of proteins. We all have personal preferences about taste or quantity, but we're actually partnering with the Strong Inside, which is an educational resource. They're, we're not selling you anything, but they're here to help you learn more about proteins from milk, specifically whey protein, which like Tony said, fits perfectly because we talk about protein a lot. And if you didn't already know, whey protein is a protein derived from milk and tested as the highest quality form of protein. And that's because it's a complete protein, meaning it contains all nine essential amino acids and is absorbed more quickly than other types of proteins. So it's found not just in your basic whey protein powder, but also added to protein bars and shakes. You can look for whey, whey protein concentrate, or whey protein isolate on labels all which deliver a high protein content. So if you are increasing your protein intake for whatever goal you have, just to make it easier, look for foods or supplements made with whey. And today, more people are looking at the science and taking a more evidence-based approach at finding their best protein. And the Strong Inside is just on a mission to educate about the benefits that complete proteins from milk provide. And the next question people have after they figure out what type is best for them is how much they need. And the strongside.com, which we'll put in the show notes below, has an easy to utilize protein calculator to help you find out how much you need based on your body weight, your fitness level, your goals, and your life stage. So you can check that out in the show notes below and to learn even more about how whey protein can help you make your goals. Let's get into it. Without further ado, <laughs> Mr. Ben Carpenter. Fun fact we just got off. We just got out of a 45 degree cold plunge. Ish. Not, not we. I was there for moral support, I would say. I she had to I hold the fort down. <laughs> you had to hold the fort down. Someone had to be, be there to make sure yeah. we didn't pass out. I'm still warming up, so you two are going to lead the conversation. I'm still <laughs> a bit fidgety because I don't really have feeling in my feet. <laughs> I wonder where people cold plunge like... I know people say they cold plunge every single day. Like, do they go in the ocean? Do they just do it in their bathtub? Is it like they come to... I've seen these baths popping up kind of like everywhere. And they're not cheap. But are, these, you said your are friends are popping up, right? They do yeah. it. Is that what it is? It's a horse trough. Basically. And they, that's the budget wow. version, like a big metal. It's the, like a massive metal. I would just get a blow up like tub and put it on my street because I don't have... A, a go down to 7-Eleven, pick, <laughs> pick up some ice baths. <laughs> my landlord comes by. I'm in a... <laughs> in a kiddie pool in the look at the lot. dinosaurs on it <sighs> uh, okay so let's do this because i know because we've been talking for a while so this is I, just for everyone listening this will probably go more just into a conversation like a good place to start mm -hmm. for those who aren't familiar with ben's work i think mariana i mean we've probably mentioned you a few times on the show just not pinpointing out but just referencing too but yeah good resource. more because good Good. Uh, good. No, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, no, all good. But it's, I think, more because we share, I think, a very similar vision of the fitness industry as a whole. When we look at health and solving our health, or if it's our fitness or just even body composition, that we treat it like a complex problem and not a complicated problem. Like a, an example would be like a car engine, right? There might be a thousand moving parts, and most people couldn't just solve a problem. But if there's a problem in there, there's a very systematic approach to fix it. And if you know enough about it, you can pinpoint that. You could ultimately just take it apart and put it back together. That's complicated. Where complex is something that is hard to control, hard to predict, and unavoidable when humans are involved. Raising a five-year-old, right? If you had a hundred five-year-olds and you did the exact same stimulus, right? The exact same nutrition, schooling, anything else, it's like those hundred five-year-olds are not going to end up as the same thing. But I think that's how we view health i think people try and look at it like they're trying to solve a complicated problem what's the best diet what's the best meal timing what's the best workout and it's like well there's not a best right that at least that's the best way i think i've kind of put it would you agree that's kind of where well, you view it a little bit like people striving for optimal is that what you mean trying to find the best solution for everything yeah mm -hmm. the best i i think so but i think i think it's a a fair question because if you were new to the industry and you're like teenager finding the gym for the first time, 
especially when you flick through magazines, you'll often see like best workout program for abs, best workout program mm. for biceps or whatever, best diet to get a six pack. I think it's almost like we grow into an industry where that's how it's marketed. And I think immediately it's almost human nature to gravitate towards. So what is the best? Like, what is the one? What's the one I should be doing? Um, but I feel like there's almost a kind of a bell curve in the industry where you can analyze it a lot and you have all the complicated uh, research that people trip over. And then it's almost like you spend longer in the industry and then you realize that most of it doesn't really matter. I feel like Tony and I, were we were sitting down the other day and we're like trying to define health versus fitness, right? Because you get on social media and you're bombarded by what you see first, right. especially in the fitness space. So if someone is getting on doing a workout, have their shirt off, have chiseled, super, super lean, sometimes you can assume, okay, well, if their recommendations are probably ones I should take maybe for my health or th their diet might be right for me. But we're trying to define the difference. And we're like, okay, so the difference between health and fitness in the real world or on social media because sometimes there's some crossover. So we want to get your take on like if you could define health force versus fitness. It's, it's kind of an odd one for me. The fitness industry, especially with social media, is obviously very visual. Yeah. And I think especially, at least for me, when I started in the industry, fitness wasn't on social media. Like Facebook wasn't a thing. Instagram wasn't a thing. Fitness for me was magazines, men's fitness, flex, muscle and fitness, whatever. So for me, fitness was literally epitomized by what I could see. It was the physiques in the magazines, normally people that were oiled up on a cocktail of questionable pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and that was kind of what I aspired to. I wanted to look a certain way. And I went into that hardcore aesthetic goal of trying to look like that, thinking that's what fitness was. Mm. And I think it, it probably took me many, many years before I realized that that isn't what fitness is and I think an easy way although describing health is obviously multifaceted and mm. complicated I think an easy way to point out that aesthetics and fitness aren't the same thing is when I get out of the cold plunge and that guy's like oh you're ripped yeah but if I tried running for a bus I would get out <laughs> of breath like really fucking quickly but people will look and see muscularity or a body fat percentage and be like oh my god that guy's he's in such good shape he's really fit there are people with much higher body fat percentages than me that if we actually did fitness tests side by side, they would embarrass me. And to me, I think that's one of the things that's really important to talk about because I feel like we romanticize aesthetics too much, especially with social media. If you want to get a lot of clients in the fitness world, I feel like for guys, topless selfies and topless training videos slathered in baby oil, is almost like a shortcut to get there. But it's not. It's obviously not indicative of someone's knowledge. It's not indicative of how much they can help you. And even even last week, I think I made a video saying uh, someone being in good shape, quote unquote, is not indicative that they would be a good trainer. There yeah. are people that don't look a certain way who have incredible knowledge, incredible skill set, and it pisses people off. Yeah. They're like, no, I, if I'm hiring a personal trainer, they need to look like what I want to look like. And to me, that's, like I understand the psychology, but I think it's a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. The road to get there and what that takes from an emotional, physical, mental perspective. Like, do you, ha did you ever have any moments where you're like, who, who am I? Like, what, what am I actually chasing? What's my quality of life like? Or am I sacrificing my mental health in order to become extremely lean? I was going to say, is there like a breaking point? When you said you didn't realize it for years, like, was there a breaking point that showed up like that? I feel like there must have been, but I can't think back to a specific instance. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think it's maybe like a little bit of growing up and yeah. working with more clients and having more kind of real world experience. And I think a lot, a lot of people compete in, say, bodybuilding or physique contests or whatever. And I think a lot of them, when they finish their first contest, because I never competed, but I would do photo shoots, which is the same type of dieting process. And I think a lot of people compete once and realize that it's not what they thought it was. And I think I had that type of moment. So yeah. 
I would describe it as if I was 85 kilos, I could diet down to 80 kilos really comfortably. But when I dieted down to photo shoot level of leanness, I went down to 75 kilos and I felt fucking dreadful. Yeah. And I was 85 kilos with a kind of visible six pack. And when I dieted down to 75 kilos or 170 pounds ish, um, I noticed a lot of things that people weren't talking about. I had idealized uh, or idolized the photos in magazines of guys with shredded six packs. Um, and that's what I wanted to look like. And when I got to that point, I felt fucking dreadful. Mm -hmm. So I had I had no libido. I was uh, kind of anxious, irritable. I got so much brain fog that I went to uh, pay for, I would say petrol, but in America I'd say gas, <laughs> pay for gas. And I handed over my card and I'd forgotten my four digit pin code. Wow. The only time I'd ever, and I literally had a mind blank and I couldn't use it. And I had to use a backup way of paying. I had to find cash because I couldn't remember my pin code. And I was weaker in the gym. I was so hungry and I think that was the, the biggest one was I was so hungry that by the end it was almost like I was on a low carb and low fat diet because you're on kind of poverty calories. And I remember I would eat dinner and I would sit there and I'd do this and I'd tap because I was so irritable because I was still hungry mm. and I was eating a full size dinner and it was like my body was fighting back so much that I could feel myself like I was just dying for more food. Yeah. And, um, I think a lot of people, and like there's even research studies that kind of support this, when they look at bodybuilders, even if they do survey data or they do blood work or whatever, they will notice things like preoccupation with food has gone up. They will notice that testosterone levels in men or in women have gone down. They'll not notice that leptin levels plummeted. And a lot of those normalize when people regain um, a certain amount of weight or a certain amount of body fat. And it's normal that we know that when people diet to very low levels of body fat, that their appetite goes up, mm -hmm. their sex drive often goes down, lots of kind of physiological mm -hmm. adaptations. But I don't feel like the fitness industry is very good at communicating that. Was there anything, anybody mentioning that? So the first time I ever talked about this was years and years and years ago. And I remember posting on my Facebook page almost as like a bit of interest where I said, I asked uh, almost like a poll do you think that bodybuilders have higher rates of disordered eating? It was something very like basic and no, almost no one agreed. And I remember reading that thinking, it surprises me because I think if you hung around bodybuilders and you actually saw how most of them live, you would go, they're not regular humans. They, the way they operate for their sport. And I remember doing a video on just talking about some research relating to disordered eating, but also body dysmorphia and muscle dysmorphia, especially in men, um, drug abuse, for example. And I got a lot of pushback, and this was many years ago. And then when I made one a couple of years back, I got less pushback. Yeah. But it still feels like it pisses a lot of people off. And it actually surprises me because you're allowed to like something and still know that it's not the healthiest thing. Someone can smoke and say... I know that this isn't good for me, but I enjoy smoke. And you go, okay. But when you say certain aspects of bodybuilding might not be the healthiest endeavors from a mental health or a physical health perspective, it's amazing how many people that pisses off, especially yeah. when they hold that identity close to their heart, I think. I was yeah. going to say, who'd you notice it pissed off the most? Was it people that were in the industry or was it people on the like I going through I, to the outside? Based on profile photos, I would guess people in the industry. TikTok was a absolute cluster comment section was a cluster well it's interesting because it's when i was in the peak of my eating was the control of what i put into my mouth it satisfied whatever in my brain was so off kilter i, I had to, i had to have that control food is everywhere so you have constant stimuli and whether it's physical whether it's mental whether it's it's visual you have a constant reminder of something that you have to be very, very in control of. And once you're slightly thrown off, whether it's, you know, you had a plan to go out to eat and you already knew what you were getting and they were out of it. Or if your family brought up that you were going out to eat last minute and you have your food planned out. Yeah, that may seem like it's not the biggest deal, but worrying about that, 
the mental worry that that's going to happen, it can seep into so many aspects of your life. A lot comes with that other than just hunger, other than just being hungry, because food is everywhere. How do you just get on and, and explain that without accusing people of having all these like disorders, so to say? I think the thing with bodybuilding is it's very extreme, obviously. Mm -hmm. it's, it's getting, if you have excess body fat you can get rid of, you're not lean enough. That's kind of how bodybuilding works. You don't stand on stage being like, oh, I could lose a few extra percent. I chose not to. It's pushing your body to the limit. And there are certain, I think there are certain costs involved in trying to get to that point. So for example, if you said to regular people, you're not going to eat lunch with your friends because you will be so paranoid about what you're eating. Most people would say that sounds terrible, but for bodybuilders, that's so normal. Yeah. And uh, I, I've been in the industry a lot. I've, I've socialized with bodybuilders, I've socialized with fitness models, and the worst I have ever seen people around food have been fitness professionals. Mm -hmm. And as an example, I don't mind sharing this as a story now because it's so many years ago that the people involved, this is like an anonymous story. As an example, I went to dinner with um, some old friends who I'm not close with anymore. And I remember being there at a nice restaurant, nice Italian restaurant in Las Vegas. And one person bought their Tupperware and they're like, I just have plain chicken. There was nothing else in there. Mm. It was just a plain chicken breast. That was what they were allowed to eat. They weren't competing. Someone else asked for chicken and broccoli. That's the one thing they were allowed to eat. Could I have chicken and broccoli, please? And they said, well, we have chicken, but we, we don't have broccoli anywhere on the menu. So they said, okay, I won't eat. Mm. The next person uh, ended up leaving because, and I quote, the smell of food was making them hungry. And the person halfway through the main course, the person who declined chicken and a substitute vegetable got so hungry that they ended up eating someone else's pizza. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember watching it. This might have been a kind of turning point moment for me. I'm, I remember watching it thinking, a couple of years ago, this probably, probably would have been me. Mm -hmm. And it kind of blew my mind that I had stepped back and realized that is very normal for them. It's very normal for a lot of people within that space. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about control, I think something that's really interesting with this is there was like a narrative paper by Eric Helms, I think in 2019. Um, and he was talking about susceptibility, um, almost like people are preconditioned psychologically to gravitate towards the sport people that have high levels of perfectionism, people that get obsessive about things or compulsive about things. There's, there's certain aspects of bodybuilding that can be um, appealing because you get to control your food intake. Mm. And a lot of people, I, I believe, are drawn to the sport because it suits their psychological traits. And I think obsession for a lot of people is one of them. And I think perfectionism for me was one as well because it was so easy to try and be perfect with everything. You, you have your exact meal plan. You don't deviate from that. If you go out to lunch with your friends, you will take your own food because uh, you're not sure who's cooking what or you're not sure what's going to be on the menu. And there's something so rigid about it. Mm -hmm. I knew one person who genuinely said to me, like she was hardcore. She was like proper high level bodybuilder. She said, I eat white fish and green vegetables for 12 weeks. I've always thought about it in that mental side of it is when you're really obsessive with being just perfect like what other sport gives you that exact almost blueprint of do xyz in this exact order don't deviate and you'll see success or some order of success because everything else there's multiple different ways things can go but in bodybuilding it kind of seems it's like it is everything is laid out depending on your coach do it check off every single box and you get where you want to go i feel like it should be eye-opening for people if they looked at typical contest prep diets because I don't think many people would look at a contest prep diet and think that's normal. Like, how many times have you seen, oh, I ate chicken, broccoli, rice five times a day yeah, or something like that? Mm -hmm. But to most people, if you said that, they would immediately think, that doesn't sound, are you sure that's healthy? Something doesn't mm -hmm. sound right there. But in bodybuilding, that's the cost. That mm -hmm. is the cost of being good at your sport. And it's a fine line between this is what it takes to excel in our sport. And are you sure you're not suffering with something?
Well, and that kind of ble- has started to bleed over over the last few years, not just to succeed in that sport, but that's now bled over into what people think it takes to be just healthy. Like if they want not to just look good, but feel like they want to feel their best, what most people's goals are, I think that's where it's bled into, is people see the chicken, rice, broccoli, and they see someone look like a cover magazine, and they say, okay, that's what it needs to do. That, that's what it takes. A little bit differently, I think that people look at that and think that, well, I want to look like that. I want to lose weight. And especially if you're talking about the general population, again, I think about it all the time, the body building community, and especially those on social media, so small. But when you're talking about the average person taking that type of advice, once you start to see that advice, you know, if you want to lose weight, you want to lose it fast, plain chicken, veggies, white rice, nothing in a package, right? It's now people are thinking, oh, okay, well, they look like that. So I'm going to take this and ignoring the health part. I don't know if that's kind of something you notice, like, especially, I mean, people want to lose fat. People want to lose weight. I I agree with both of you, even though you had slightly different perspectives. So as an example, if I was a teenager going through a fitness magazine, I would see the fat loss diet. So I, I do think that that bleeds out. I do think that it starts with hardcore fitness culture and then I think it trickles out towards the mainstream but then I also think that a lot of people see that and can almost rebel against that advice because they think that's what it takes and it's almost like uh, an artificially high threshold of what it takes to be healthy Mm -hmm. so for example I remember a client saying to me almost word for word he said I don't think I will ever get the body that I want because I see how you eat and I can't eat like that. And he he joked and he's like, you live your life like a Buddhist monk because I'm so regimented with how I eat. I drink alcohol at the time. I was super strict on everything. And he's like, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of those examples where people aren't always setting the example they think they are by being as regimented as they think it takes. So I was being more regimented than probably 99.99% of people. And I had people clients coming to me who were more like a 50% person thinking they had to meet me on that level if they wanted the same. Mm-hmm. And I think there's, there's a risk there. Yeah. That type of messaging. Do you think it comes down to definitions too, where I feel like those two things go hand in hand? People see their health and their fitness as one thing instead of separate? Like the aesthetic and the feeling and the inside as one thing? I think so. And I think, I think one of the kind of risks with this is it's also part of the reason that I try and talk about health from a slightly more uh, multifactorial perspective is because people are so used to seeing obesity equals bad, body fat equals bad, that I think it is almost simplified that dieting is always healthy because if they can reduce their body fat level, their health must improve because they know body fat is bad. And I think there's almost like in people's mind, almost a, a kind of linear spectrum where as long as they're losing body fat, they're improving their health. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter how restrictive the diet is. It doesn't matter how um, ri- ridiculous the plan is that they're following. If they're going in that direction, it must be a good thing. Whereas mental health, for example. Mental health is still a, it's still a part of health. You have to be so regimented all the time in order to get that, that physical achievement. When you sacrifice the mental portion of it, how will you even notice that you have achieved this? If your mental health is at an all-time low, how do you know when it's enough? It's, it's a slippery slope of losing yourself along the way. I think this is a message that I feel like I should have talked about earlier. But I have a very strong belief that some people are incredible at losing fat themselves. And that actually makes them a terrible coach for most people. And as an, as an example of that... Bodybuilders, for example, I know bodybuilders who can diet down to levels of body fat that most people will never even get close to. But if a regular Joe person asked for dietary advice, I would say that is not the person for you to follow. And I think it's from a psychological perspective. I think people who, for example, have always been a quote-unquote healthy weight and they have dieted down to bodybuilding shows and back I don't think they often realize 
what it's like for people who aren't already at that level at that level average adult u.s diet is estimated by some estimates to be 60 percent ultra processed foods and bodybuilders are eating sometimes eight different foods or fewer literally over the course of their diet it's like chicken rice broccoli oats potato and they're so used to existing on us some of them are so used to existing on a small number of, of foods that i don't think their dietary advice should go outside of that specific goal for that specific person. I think people can be really good at something and still be terrible coaches. I was This actually just cl clicked in my head a little bit. This is one thing I think I appreciate about how you communicate to people, especially through your content. And I don't know if you're, you've connected this to. A lot of the times I think people speak in order to like say what they need to say and not say what others need to hear. I think that's what you do a really good job communication wise. When you're putting together a message or even writing your book, do you think of it their perspective before your own? Almost always. Mm. But I think part of that is when I was personal training people, I had a really diverse client base. And when you're used to working with a very um, kind of diverse group of people, it becomes so glaringly obvious that what works for one person won't work for someone else. As kind of a, like a stark contrast example, one guy comes to me and says, hey, I want to be a fitness model. Um, he was already kind of well on the way, but he said, I need some fine tuning with my diet. I need some fine tuning with my training. Here are the calories that I'm eating. Here's my macronutrient split. Here's my training program. I log everything. Um, another person came to me and they're like, I want to improve my health a little bit. And they didn't know what a carbohydrate was, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and when I did a really informal kind of food recall, like a questionnaire with them, so just tell me roughly what you eat. Give me some kind of food choices. Um, they realized super quickly that they barely ate a vegetable, let alone vegetables, plural. Uh, they drank what they realized was probably a dangerous amount of alcohol. Working with pe people from both ends of the spectrum, it makes me kind of almost hyper aware of when I'm putting out advice, who's listening. And that's part of the reason why I try and phrase it in a way where it's like, Use this information as you wish. I try not to talk about me at all. I'm mm -hmm. always like, here's what research says. Here's how it might benefit you. I was going to say, that could almost get you like lost down a rabbit trail of like, well, crap, I could say it like this. But what if someone like this listens? And like, that doesn't make, that doesn't apply. Because you, you really have to do, you have to talk to where it applies to as many people as possible. I remember seeing a kind of recent bodybuilding video and they were giving out dietary advice to people. And they're just taking videos of people eating and saying, here's what you should do to fix your diet. If, if you actually spoke to any registered dietitians and asked them how they work with clients, that is not how they would work with clients. Just seen a 15 second video of what you're eating in one day, it's not optimal. Here's what you should do. Swap this vegetable for this vegetable, mm -hmm. cut this down by 25 grams or whatever. And that's not how people work. It's, it's niche advice that probably should stay within the niche audience. That is something that I notice more and more, and especially after going through schooling, how many recommendations are made that are based off of such niche research. I, I always cut the social media reader some slack because mm -hmm. I think if any fitness professional rewinds 10, 15 years or whatever, if they wrote down the things they used to believe that they don't believe, they'd be like, you know what? Everyone gets it wrong. That's part of the reason why I tend to be generous with um, how people interpret things. I personally think whenever I, someone asks me, like, oh, how should we know who to trust? I'm just throwing out there. I don't think you ever can because there is, there is no way for your average person to know what science is legit mm -hmm. or not legit. And as like a parallel, take someone who knows nothing about cars. If they took their car to a garage or two garages or three garages, if three mechanics told them three different things, they do not have it in their knowledge base to know which one of those people they should trust. And I think that's what's happening on social media. You have people giving you different stories, often one-sided, often clickbait, often attention grabbing. Here's one research paper that said this, where, whereas you will read that and go, here are 10 research papers that say the opposite. Yeah. But I don't think the average reader is expected to know who to trust. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that is part of the reason I like associating with good people because ultimately uh, you're all on the same page for trying to clean up the industry as a whole. 
it has gotten to the point, the study that you were actually bringing up too, where we've kind of realized the who to trust kind of thing. It's not really who can you trust moving forward, but like, I guess more navigating in the moment because it is, I don't know if anyone's ever going to be 100% correct with everything they ever do, but that's what kind of people are looking for. They're looking for like a piece. I want to like put you here in concrete. Don't move. I can trust you, whatever you say for the rest of time. I mean, how many people on, I guarantee you, okay, I guarantee the people who follow you too. How many people would trust you could say the most ridiculous thing today and like, all right, I'm in, I'm in. Because, but you've also built so much trust with it, so it's a little bit different. But I, I actually like. I don't want that though. I made a video, um, and I made a video saying you shouldn't trust someone just because they're a doctor. For example, if being a doctor was a firm black and white criteria on if you can trust someone or not, every single doctor is correct with every single piece of advice they've ever given. So the point I was making is you can't assume someone is always right all the time, regardless of their qualifications. And I remember someone kind of almost getting angry at me and being like, well, how can we trust you? And I was like, no, no, no. It's, I think humans have a, almost like a natural instinct where it's easy to break things down as black and white. It's like, here are people I can trust, here are people I can't. Mm -hmm. But there are loads of people who I don't think are trustworthy who are still correct sometimes. I have responded to videos when I've been tagged and said, no, what they're saying there is correct. Mm -hmm. And people are like, oh yeah, but they're kind of getting angry at me saying that, you shouldn't trust that person. I'm like, I haven't never said whether you should or shouldn't. I feel like information should be evaluated on its own merit. And if someone says two plus two equals four, they are correct regardless of their qualifications. And what I'm saying is you should always look at information on its own merit. Sometimes people are terrible sources of information, but they're still correct. Sometimes people are great sources of information, but incorrect. Okay. Yeah. It's like sharpening the tool of just how to, teaching people how to think and to figure this out because it is, it's, Nothing's going to be concrete. Do you know who I think is, if I had to say to people, here are some red flags on if you wanted to think someone was trustworthy. You could never trust someone 100%. You should never trust someone 100% Mm -hmm. when it comes to fitness information. But do they cite research? Because I feel like that is a very low threshold for what we consider evidence-based. Saying something and they have no research. And I think that's an easy criteria. Do they speak in absolutes? Because most people, kind of evidence-based people, use words like may or perhaps because they know that evidence changes. Mm -hmm. So pick a popular topic like artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners cause X, Y, Z. Most people will say at the moment the evidence does or doesn't support that. But they know that evidence can change. Mm -hmm. And they know that there's a kind of evolution of evidence. So most people will say, we don't know at the moment. There's no evidence to show that, so we shouldn't say that that definitely causes that. And people in the science community know that's how you talk. But when they say sweeteners cause this or sweeteners, that to me is a red flag. Yeah. Because what they should really be doing is there is evidence that sweeteners cause this in rats or there is evidence that sweeteners are linked with this in humans at this dose. Mm-hmm. There are always qualifiers and stipulations and people that are very adamant they don't give those qualifiers and stipulations. I think that is a sign that you should not trust them. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you should trust people more so if it looks like they're willing to engage. Yeah. So I think if you posted something and I said, hey, is there any research for that? I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. If you came back and said, yeah, here it is. To me, that is a green flag. Yeah, I I completely agree. And it's like having that baseline threshold is so important for someone being evidence-based if you want to make that decision on who you trust, because that's up to you. How much do you think that someone's eating pattern versus a specific food in terms of importance matters for their success in their weight loss journey? Or if someone's not paying attention to their dietary pattern, how are we eating as a whole? Do you think that that's often discussed on social media? I don't think it's often discussed on social media. And I think, for example, one of the things that I really like about your content and this is it's going to seem like an, an odd piece of praise, but I like that you will cook with different ingredients. A lot of fitness people aren't promoting recipes. They're not promoting food diversity. Mm-hmm. It's about restriction. It's about limitations. It's about narrow food selections. And I love that you will come in with a, an eight-ingredient recipe. I think if someone's goal is to lose weight, I think there are different vehicles to that destination. And... 
that's one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand because you can go about getting to that destination in a way that probably isn't going to be best for your health or you can go about it in a way that is probably going to be better for your mental health. So, for example, if you had 10 clients and five of them you said, okay, here's a celery juice cleanse, you're going to go away, you're going to go on this celery juice cleanse, you're going to eat nothing but chicken and broccoli plus celery juice, they will all lose weight, but most of them will feel shit. There mm-hmm. will be nutrient deficiencies. They won't be able to stay with that diet very long. Even if they do lose weight, they don't know how to transition out of dietary phase. Whereas if you said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's your existing dietary pattern. I like the idea of improving on what you have, whether it's more vegetables, whether it's less alcohol, whether it's fewer ultra-processed foods. And you can make gentler changes that might not get them to that destination as quickly as the first group, but they might get there in a way that is very little mental stress. Yeah. You might get them there in a way that when they get there, it's actually easy for them to stay there, for example. Um, so I personally love the idea of focusing more on improving existing dietary patterns versus hyper-focusing on what foods you absolutely should avoid or you should eat more of. Mm. Because I think it's looking at things in a vacuum. It's To me, it's kind of like saying, how many sets of bench press should I do? How many are you doing? What else are you doing? Mm. You're recovering. What's your diet like? So many questions, like into individual variability. And to give a firm answer, like, should I eat this or should I not eat this? To me, it's just... Can't answer the question. Yeah. yeah, you can't answer it. I like the idea of saying, "Here's an existing dietary pattern. Are there any ways that you can improve that?" And trying not to do the commonplace thing of, "What foods do I need to cut out? Mm-hmm. I'm going to lose weight. Here are foods I'm not allowed to eat." As a coach, has that always been your approach, or is that something that kind of developed more, more and more over time? It's, it's definitely developed more over time, but I'm a personal trainer by trade i am the personal trainer that reads a lot dietary recommendations i give to people tend to be kind of gentle nutrition advice anyway Mm -hmm. i talk about research on social media but part of the reason i do it in a here's what research says is because i'm never supposed to be that person that says here's what you should do with your diet so i will often say here's some research on high protein diets here's some research on ultra processed foods or fruits and vegetables or legumes or whatever but i'm i've never been a Here's what you should do with your diet to get shredded. Mm. It's, I don't like uh, firm prescriptions are outside of my my scope. Um, so from a kind of evidence perspective and how I do it on social media, that's always been pretty similar. But how I've done it myself, I was I was the like, here are the foods I can eat, here are the foods I can't. <laughs> The yeah. men's health meal plan to get shredded six pack by summer. But that's what it was, wasn't it? I don't know what magazines are like now, but it's meal plans. It's very easy to say like, the idea of meal plans is shit. I'm, I'll just, I'll, I'll be brutal with it. The idea of having a meal plan that tens of thousands of readers look at and go, this is the one thing I'm supposed to copy. It doesn't make sense when you think about it like that. But part of the reason that meal plans appeal to people is because there's simplicity, I think. It's the, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Here it is. And I think that's also something that people, perhaps on social media and educators, perhaps get wrong or could do better with is I feel like they sometimes forget that people want simple answers. It's very easy to overcomplicate things. We all know the importance of calories. Anyone listening to your podcast knows the importance of calories. And yes, there might be some arguments um, on the implementation of reduced calorie diets, for example. Most people don't deny that calories are at least a thing and they have some relevance. Common dietary advice in evidence-based circles is here is your ideal rate of weight loss. So what you're going to do is calculate your approximate total daily energy expenditure. Then you're going to reduce it by X percentage to hit this ideal rate of weight loss per week. And I feel like that's advice that most people don't even understand. And even if they do understand it, I don't think they realize the nuance of how that might not work. They don't realize that calculating your total daily energy expenditure is a bit of a guess. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that the rate of fat loss isn't as precise as it's being laid out. And I think selling people the complicated advice is sometimes not the way. But with the evidence base, is that something that you have always, how'd you find yourself there gravitating more towards research? Was that where you were when you're going towards the magazine cover goal? No, I'm not, I'm not even really sure where it started. I've, 
I have a an obsessive personality. I've always had an obsessive personality. I describe it as when I was a kid, I used to pick up trends late and I would overtake everyone who was doing that trend. <laughs> it's like I picked it up late and then I got obsessive and then I completed it. Mm. I was really late to pick up yo-yos. And next thing I know, I'm going to shops who can verify I can do two-handed yo-yo <laughs> tricks. Mm -hmm. And they would, it was, I, I got obsessive about things. All of my hobbies I got obsessive with. And I remember reading, I remember reading an article that disputed something that I thought was true in the fitness world. And I remember thinking, it was kind of like a penny drop moment. And that's when I first started reading research papers. So one of the first research papers I ever discussed on social media was talking about the differences between rigid and flexible dietary restraint. Mm. Because from my, my belief was there were foods that you should never eat. And I remember reading an article that made a compelling case and I went away and read that research paper and I didn't really understand it, but it was enough for me to think, hmm, maybe I'm not correct. Mm -hmm. And that was almost like it opened the floodgates and then I got obsessive with the habit and now I read research papers for fun. Yeah. Is it the obsession with just wanting to like completely understand, like almost like protecting yourself from being wrong? Because I know I, that's where it kind of, kind of comes from in my head is like, I just want to make sure I, I'm not wrong. So I just want to understand every little piece so do you get like in that obsessive kind of mood where you just want to do that or is it something else i'm not even sure what my what my psychology is like what my motivation is for it but like for example if you said to me right now hey let's make a video pick a topic it doesn't matter what that topic is i will spend four times as long researching it as i need to to make that video yeah. um so for example i once i wanted to make a video about things that could be bad for mental health but i can't just make the video i have to here's a study, here's a study, here's a study. Mm -hmm. But to cite this study, I just wanted to make sure that there were no conflicting studies. So then I'm going down a <laughs> rabbit hole. And then I read a randomized control trial that um, was a kind of rebuttal to some of the observational data. And I was like, is that the only randomized control trial? Is there a systematic review on this? And it's, it's, I think it's just like a fascination rabbit hole. I completely agree, especially with the, the research aspect it was something that I was really fascinated with when I got to college the idea that you have the endless possibility to ask why wherever the research started yeah. you have the opportunity to continue to evolve it I need to see this from all angles because if I'm reading that this food increases your risk for heart disease I know that someone else is wondering what about the people who this didn't increase heart disease for like, what about the people who are also prioritizing their sleep and less stressed and walk more? What about those people? That's actually what's happening with research. You're trying to ask why. It starts from this mm -hmm. theory or idea. It could turn into a question you're trying to answer. Whether you're trying to prove or disprove or be right is, is not really it. You're trying to evolve this field or this idea. And that is something where it's like you're sitting down to make a video on a topic. That is the rabbit hole. Critically thinking taking other perspectives, that's where I, at least I think my obsession with research began is because mm -hmm. I found that so fascinating, especially finding out views that I would have never thought myself. I think one of the interesting things that you said is you're like, all research has flaws. And I don't think people realize mm -hmm. just how important that is. Most research papers, when you read through, as you know, they will include a section at the end where they say limitations. Mm -hmm. And it might be, for example, pick something like fasted cardio. Most people in the fitness industry by now don't think that fasted cardio is better for fat loss. But if you read the first kind of randomized control trial that actually tested this, they will say the sample size was small. We can't necessarily extrapolate it to other populations. Maybe it would be different if someone had a different body fat percentage or a different age. And everyone will be like, fasted cardio is bullshit. But what most people tend to say is like, it probably isn't better for fat loss based on like what we have mm -hmm. but if a bigger trial comes out or they do it in a different group of people or they have a different methodology maybe that would change our mind and i think it's so important for people to understand that every study has limitations yeah. and that's not a bad thing that's the area that you need to understand if you want to have a better grasp of the information that you're digesting that's where I'm looking for when someone's trying to communicate research is using those limitations 
to, especially if someone's making recommendations. Yeah. How are you also using those and accounting for <laughs> those pieces? Because then you can be more clear about how this is not concrete, this is not black and white, this may not include everyone. When I was, uh, when I was writing my book, there was a very flippant end of the paragraph sentence and I was talking about high protein diets. There's pretty solid evidence that high protein diets are better for lean body mass retention than low protein diets. That's not something most people dispute. Um, and I put on the end, higher protein diets when people are dieting, I'm obviously just guessing the, the phrasing, higher protein diets may be beneficial when dieting because it's better for lean body mass um, retention. They also seem to promote at least slightly more fat loss even if weight loss is a bit more marginal, there might also be a benefit for appetite regulation. And my editor came back to me and said, you are being unnecessarily conditional by using words like may and perhaps, can you give a more concrete, yes, they do, no, they don't. And I was like, no. no. Because in my opinion, when people say the research on protein and appetite, I personally think that they're too hard-nosed with it where they say protein is great for appetite regulation i don't think that's supported by literature i think higher protein diets could be better for appetite regulation but i don't think it makes sense to say they definitely are because mm. i don't think they are under all circumstances there's probably a ceiling where going above that isn't likely to be superior and just because i said there may be a benefit for appetite regulation and she's like no 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 people need a yes it does no it doesn't and i was like but that's not the point of the book yeah. i'm not trying to like screw myself to one stance and think this is where it's at mm -hmm. okay because communication i always think is one of the biggest aspects of anything in life like your personal relationships how you teach how you grow your career anything like communication is important like the weight of every single word really does matter when you were going through the process of writing your book, it seems like you went through a lot of those like clashes because this person's like, well, this is what's going to sell the book. And you're like, well, it's not what I'm <laughs> trying to do here. Like I'm trying to teach a little bit. Did you improve certain aspects of your own communication or did you realize there's any like blind spots you had before writing going in through that whole process? Yeah, that's a good question. Just because I'm like, there's not, I mean, that's a, a book you, is a lot of words. You, you know what? There, there were aspects of communication that I, I, I always feel like I'm improving communication over time. Like every time you post on social media, you have a little bit of feedback. If a post does well, you know that it's resonated with people, for example. And maybe it resonated because of the way you communicated it. Maybe it was short, maybe it was catchy, maybe it was how quickly you were cutting between your chopping shots or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I feel like every time you post on social media, you get a little bit of feedback on whether you are good at communicating something and whether you can improve it. And with the like with the book, for example, I realized that I probably talk too much. I I have a lot of a lot of things that I, I want to say, but ultimately you're only as useful as someone can understand. So for example, if you made a if you picked a topic, let's say creatine, if you do a podcast and you talk for an hour about creatine, some people will fucking love it. Mm -hmm. They will love it. Best podcast they've ever listened to mm -hmm. creatine. Some people are going to get five minutes in and they're going to, and I don't think you can be everything for all people. Yeah. But I feel like there's a certain sweet spot that if you looked on social media, for example, you know roughly videos longer than this don't tend to do well on this platform. Mm -hmm. People's attention span, they don't want to watch a 10 minute TikTok, for example. And I think... I try and play the odds where I don't want to be too detailed that I know most people aren't going to handle it, but I also don't want to be too simple that I think I'm not giving people the facts. So I think it's just trying to find that sweet spot. But then you have this with social media when you make content. You know, you want to be informative. You don't want to be clickbaity. You don't want to make it too short. You don't want to say mm -hmm. anything that you can't mm -hmm. fully agree with, but you also know you can't do a 20 minute video on creatine because you're going to lose so many people yeah. that's always the hard the balance part i think some people that you see i think that show up on most people's feeds the people who are shirtless in grocery stores saying artificial sweeteners cut mm -hmm. yeah things like that and it's like there i think that's where it just comes like where they they go a little too far on the whole i got to simplify this so as many people listening can hear like turn up the notch a hundred percent of the people listening are going to hear what i say instead of the balance of like okay where can i maybe see 80 percent of the people 
hear what I say, but also <laughs> not just completely go clickbait mode. And like as like a, an example of that, like your grocery store one. If you said research supports that a dietary pattern that's higher in this fatty acid may be better for heart health in the long run, snooze fest. Mm -hmm. Someone comes in and goes, seed oils, they cause cancer, viral. Yeah, it's so funny. I get a lot, especially lately, it goes up and down, but I will get a lot of like my followers saying, I never see your videos anymore. I'm so shocked that it came up. And it's, I do <laughs> struggle sometimes to be that person that can be really quick at explaining. You've probably already noticed it now. Sometimes I, I dance a little bit around and will explain too much and that's okay. But I can't sacrifice that on social media. If there's an explanation, I want to explain it. And I know that that's not going to receive traction. So sometimes it's it's hard. It's really, really difficult to weigh out when you want to reach and educate. But then there's this factor of what can I leave out here without it being misleading yeah. versus the how can I leave as much out as possible and attract as many people as possible. But that's the reality of social media is. And I think that's also something I, I think about when I'm trying to learn if I should listen to someone or not is that's an element. To I it. think if I put a gun to your head and said, you need to get a million followers by the end of the year, you would both change your content. Yeah. 100%. Because you'd have to. Yeah. Yeah. Life on the line. You could, you, mm -hmm. you know what, you know, it does, you know, yeah. it works. Going back to having a goal and then picking the method to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, that's why you do have a podcast where you talk about science yeah. because to some people, they love the way that they want to watch you dance. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but to other people on social media, they're like, they just want someone that's going to, Give them a 10 second. Well, it's like you kind of got to train your brain to like want to listen to the dance a little bit. If I think it, for the people listening, it's like if you're like, I keep getting tricked, I keep doing these stupid diets, how do I keep following? It's like you kind of train your brain to listen to the dance a little bit more, right? Like that's kind of like a, just a style of listening and a style of thinking that you kind of got to. I know I had to go through it just from when I was in my teenage years, how many stupid diets I followed or something like that from the magazines or from was it, was Instagram even big then? I don't even know what it was, but just those random diets or training programs where I'm like, okay, I don't have abs. Six weeks, I'm gonna do this every day. For, and every time I'd be like, I hate wasting my time. This is so stupid. But then you kind of start to learn like, oh, you gotta get as much as you actually can absorb. So it's almost like from a listener standpoint, you gotta just kind of train yourself because it's uncomfortable not to just be like, take an answer. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable at first. I don't know if you ever felt like we're that quick grabbing kind of person, but I feel like most people were when they started. You know, where they would take anything that was handed to them. They're like, oh, this is the answer. This mm. is it. Yeah, I was, I, I mean, I was probably the same. I, th I think people, I think people, when you say you have to like train yourself, I think part of that might just be interest. Like when you have tried enough fad diets that you suddenly have interest in why are these not working me, then perhaps that's why you're going a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think you need to be everyone's, in England we've got a saying, you don't need to be everyone's cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you two spend hours making podcasts that go into this much detail, that's for people that, you, you don't have to be everyone's cup of tea, but you're like some people shot of vodka. Mm. Some people fucking love it. Is that the second part of the British? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure where, yeah. I don't know if it is or where I got that. Um, but I think that's okay. Like, I, I don't think most... I might be wrong. I don't think most people that actually care that much about science and accuracy, I don't think they go into it going, I want to build the biggest social media following possible. I don't. I know there are loads of, if you put a gun to my head and said, you need a million followers by the end of the year, all of my videos would be topless from now on. I would do things that are deliberately more controversial because polarizing is great for engagement. I would make my videos shorter. I would be more inclined to give one perspective rather than a balanced perspective um but that's just not that's not what floats my boat yeah I, I and i i feel like with diet too especially if you're trying to lose weight people don't realize the motivation aspect of it the setting goals being intrinsically motivated how important that can be in terms of whether or not this becomes something you're successful at and can keep off keep off that weight versus this is something I could be a quick easy fix and I'm going to go to an extreme because I want to look like that mm -hmm. versus I really want to feel better throughout the day I want to have energy to go on walks with my kids or my partner I want to 
feel mentally better, maybe I could eat less processed foods and eat some more vegetables. Yes. Because that's something I could continue to do for the rest of my life. If your primary driver is, I want to be thin and I want to be thin quick, can you do that for the rest of your life? Yeah, I think this, as the parallel, I feel like if you said your goal is to get a million followers by the end of the year, you're focusing on the outcome. Mm -hmm. And you probably, when someone puts a gun to your head and tries to get you to do that, you probably sacrifice something in the process, whether it's your ethics with how you post, whatever. And I feel like focusing on the outcome with weight loss is the same thing. If you read a magazine cover that says lose 40 pounds in the next month, which is a magazine cover I saw surprisingly recently, <laughs> uh, it's focusing on the outcome. And it's almost forgetting the processes that it takes to get there. So two people could lose the same amount of weight, but one of them could be on a worse diet than the other one. Um, one of them could have worse mental health than the other one. And I think that's one of the risks when it comes to focusing on the outcome of weight loss is that becomes the only metric of their success. There are many reasons, in my opinion, why that's risky. And one of them, for example, is uh, if you look at some survey data, one of the main reasons that people quit exercising is when they stop losing weight because that is their metric of success. When they're losing weight, they know the exercise plan is doing something, so they keep it going. But when their weight hits a plateau, what's my exercise program doing anymore when they stop exercising? But that is because the only way they are measuring their success is what does the number on the scale say? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like something we could criticize, like why would you only measure your success with that metric? But it's because it's the easiest metric to measure. Yeah. Like. How many people are going to the doctor and having regular blood tests? How many people are going, you know what, my blood pressure's gone down, my heart rate's gone down. Like, I don't even know what my heart rate is. Um, so that becomes the easiest way to have a numerical value attached to anything body composition related. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it scales first. For some people, they might do body fat, you know, stand on bioelectrical impedance analysis device. Some people might be a little bit more strength focused, like. I know that you, when you're talking about your bench press, you'll say, here are the numbers I'm doing. Uh, and, and that's a, like a different metric. But I feel like weight is the easiest one to do. Scales are cheap. They're non-invasive. Um, they don't require specialist equipment. You can do them regularly. People can stand on the scales once a day, multiple times per day if they want. But they can't get a DEXA scan. Yeah. They can't get regular blood tests, especially with U.S. healthcare. I don't Ain't that the no, best? You can touch that if you want to. I was like, we want to open it up. Let's do it. No, I'm definitely not. I'm definitely Clear out not. the afternoon. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not opening that up. But yeah. just as an example, I know someone who can fly to another country and get a full medical, including MRIs, colonoscopies, the lot, and fly back for a fraction of the cost that it would cost to be here. Mm -hmm. So for them and their culture, um, they would actually get yearly physicals and it wouldn't be very expensive. Yeah, That's not a thing here. And that's not really a thing in England either because NHS have um, uh, complementary care, but it's limited because it's complementary. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, pe people aren't looking at blood work. They're not saying, oh, yeah. I've, I've noticed this improvement in my blood glucose since I started exercising. It's how much do I weigh? I think that's one of the biggest things that I've learned what's over the course of my career just coaching is how you have to kind of help people really redefine what counts as success. Because if you don't, you just get stuck with the scale number because the scale is massively important in certain situations, massively. And we're, so it's not like discounting that at all. But yeah, if you don't redefine what success looks like in maybe ways that aren't so black and white where a scale, if the number goes down, that's good. If it goes up, it's bad. It's how people say it, right? Very black and white. It's harder, and I know you even open minds more to this too, but like when you're assessing things that aren't so black and white, like your hunger is improving or your energy or fatigue is improving through the day. Like stuff that's really hard until you pay attention to it to really assess moving forward. I was going to say, do you have on top of that, just outside of the scale, I'm trying to think back. I don't remember if it was a piece of your book. Do you have other things that you really push people to look for in success? Or I know you had a, a big piece on redefining what counts as a why? Do you think it starts with redefining what the why is in the first place or just how you measure success? 
I was going to say this is a great time to circle back to what you said at the beginning about what does health mean, because y- you can set expectations with people like here are some things to look for. For example, um, I think one of the easiest ways to say the scales should never be at least a sole metric of, of success is nobody can lose weight forever because they would die. Um, so weight loss cannot ever be the only way that you measure your success so i think stepping away from that and looking at other factors so some things that i like for example i personally like gym performance and the reason why i like gym performance is because if someone notices their strength going up in the gym that is at least a fairly decent proxy that they are probably going to be gaining muscle nutrition supportive you at least know they're not likely to be going backwards um So if their strength is going up, I feel like that's a good proxy indicator for whether they're gaining muscle tissue. Um, And I also think it's easier to keep track of um, over the long term, but also it can add a certain motivation towards going to the gym if you're excited to hit a new bench press goal. But body composition data is too slow for that. Most advanced, take a really advanced lifter. If you did that, if someone's been training 10 years and they did a DEXA scan, and then they did another DEXA scan four weeks later, like, what would you notice? Like, half a smidge above buck all. Mm-hmm. And beginners, possibly, but most advanced lift- lifters, their body composition changes are so slow that they can't even measure that. They can't track mm. it. It's invisible to the naked eye. So I feel like you have to rely on other things. So if you're dieting, for example, hunger, I think is really important. I think mental health and preoccupation about food because you said earlier hunger is almost easy to track compared to how obsessively Mm. you're thinking about things um i think other aspects of um physical health like how you're sleeping for example um what your stress levels are like and i think that those are all like me personally i think those are all integral components of health i think physical fitness is a core component of health and it's so interesting i always think about how there is this drive for the scale going down and it's so motivating but the reality is that's going to go back up so how can we make understanding that a reality instead of chasing something that is inevitably going to stop this is your core, core motivation so what's your plan for when you no longer have that core driver what can we do instead I have actually had these conversations with some of my clients before and the thought of that going up, it is, it, it can signal a fight or flight response. And it's really fascinating to me in the sense of just that fear of the scale going up can also be a driver, not just the scale going down, but also the fear of it. And so I'll, I really try to ask like, why, why do you have, that fear what have you been chasing so long and why do you have this fear and a lot of people don't even know why they're doing it in the first place and so it's interesting to apply that aspect out to other pieces of your life if you don't know why you're doing it how do you how do you know you can be really good at something or something is going to make you really happy if you don't even know why you're doing it in the first place yeah so i think people really underestimate that why sometimes i'll get clients and it's it's the first time you're ever asked i remember asking myself it and i was like why am i doing this (laughs) do i have no idea why i'm doing this i think it's almost i think it's probably fascinating to watch people's answers unravel if you ask that question enough times yes because uh, my beautiful wife uh talked about this recently and I think her her kind of video script was something like, I want to lose 30 pounds. Okay, why? Because I think I'll be happier. Why? Because I think I'll be healthier. Why? And a a lot of people, their answers kind of break down a little bit. They realize that they're perhaps over-relying on scale weight as a proxy to health and happiness. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's it's super important to step away from. And as, as an example of that, one research paper was talking about the psychological um, difficulties of weight maintenance versus weight loss dieting. Everyone who's listening to this knows that they can lose weight. Most people have lost weight at some point in their life, even if it's just for a few weeks. But maintaining it long term is a different uh, it's a different question altogether. 
And the example that they used in this research paper was when you see the number on the scales going down, you have an external reward validating your hard work. But weight maintenance doesn't have that external reward. Mm. So if you don't change what you are viewing as uh, a measure of success, you're kind of fucked. Like, what am I doing now? The scales haven't changed in the last month. It's uh, the, the way I kind of use it as an analogy is if you start a business and your business is earning money, it's exciting. When the numbers go in the right direction, when the graph goes in the right direction, it's exciting. But if someone came along to you and said, from this point onwards, your business can never earn more money than it's doing now. You can stay where you are for the rest of your life. Do you keep working as hard? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of parallel with weight loss because at some point, weight loss will stop. And unless weight maintenance can be seen just as trendy as weight loss was in the beginning, it will always be a neglected uh, goal. We, we were literally just having this conversation on the ride over. I was just literally driving over here this morning. Just like business, starting a business, money, how like um, what you like what you choose to motivate you, what, right? Yeah, it's this self confidence piece in knowing who you who you are, what you value, who you value, mm -hmm. and I think people also don't see the importance of your values in health behavior change and whether or not it's going to be something very easy or become intuitive and something that you can do for the rest of your life because certainty and knowing who you are and what you want can make a lot of health decisions easier. I've got a parallel question that I was talking about recently. So you're on social media. You have good size followings. People's following goes up. Social media is exciting. If your following started going down, do you enjoy the process of social media as much as you did before? Absolutely, which is actually unique because I, I am in that point now. Like sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, but the people I reach are still there. I love doing it. I love to create and it brings me joy. And if I could reach one person, I could get one comment that they learned something, they enjoyed a recipe, it helped them in some way. I'm like, this is wonderful i love this i could do it without yeah. the following and i did but i think holding on to that piece of i did this without the following loved it that is so valuable to me to not forget and i think that people can chase the high of growth and that's so there's some um, weight maintenance data that looks at that and it's perceptions of self weighing and you know how some people hate standing on the scale mm -hmm. some people don't care some people quite enjoy it but it was funny how closely uh, it correlated that people who had more of a preference for standing on the scales did so when their weight was trending in the direction they want. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that some people like it and some people don't. It was they tended to enjoy it when the number was going yeah. in the right direction. And then when the number wasn't going in the right direction, they didn't, didn't enjoy it as much. And if you use social media following as a parallel argument to that, some people post on social media because they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. some people post on social media because they like seeing the number go up. And if the number stops going up, social media suddenly isn't as fun because they ha are ha having that um, validation removed. Their reward is being shifted. And that, I think, is a really key perspective because if you enjoy the process, which is what you're doing, you don't necessarily care what's happening with the number. Mm -hmm. So if you love bench pressing or doing this type of workout or this type of physical activity... It doesn't necessarily matter if your numbers are changing that much if you enjoy it. So I'm not I'm not stronger on every exercise than I was ten years ago. I used to be stronger on some exercises than mm. I am now. But I enjoy training and that's why I keep showing up. If I only showed up when the numbers were going up, I would have probably stopped like six years ago. Stemming is what we were referring it to. Because it was it was a old tool I used to use for anxiety, just asking yourself why pretty much like ten times is like the rule, like five to ten times. If something was freaking me out, I was anxious about something. I just said, okay, why is this freaking me out? Okay, that's your good reason. Why? And you just kind of go down and you're like, oh, <laughs> I really shouldn't be worried about this. But it's the same thing when it comes down to goals because people start to fizzle after sometimes even two times asking the question why. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you, and that's at least I, everyone's going to be different. But I'm like, I found for myself, if I couldn't make it at least five or six rungs down the why chamber without having like a concrete, like, yes, that makes sense the whole thing just ended up falling apart because I'm like, it just doesn't, has no depth to it. Yeah. And it, it, it wouldn't actually stay in reach. So I think that part was 
I was excited when you were talking about that. I think you even worded it almost like that in your book, right? What happens next? Is that what it was? Like, just the chapter was like, what happens next? It's like, <laughs> So, fr like, from a research perspective, and th there are, like, fucking bazillions of reasons for this, but weight maintenance, what happens next, is neglected. It's like the unwanted sibling that most people don't care enough to talk to. And I think there are so many reasons for this. Number one, weight loss is exciting for most people. Mm. So from an individual motivation perspective, I want to lose 10 pounds sounds like an exciting goal to a lot of people. But if you said, okay, for the next 10 years, you're going to stay exactly the same. It's not exciting. Even though they are maintaining their goal, it's, it's not as exciting. From a research perspective behind the scenes, dietary intervention research isn't long. Um, weight loss trials tend to be a few weeks or a few months, sometimes more than a year. But if you're comparing, for example, um, pick, let's pick a popular diet trend at the moment. Let's say alternate day fasting. The first pilot trial of alternate day fasting in humans was like 22 days. And then they did one where they had a randomized control trial that was eight weeks long. And it was the concept of this is just as good probably as continuous energy restriction for weight loss over an eight week period. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets excited with alternate day fasting. It's this new novel approach and you can eat as much as you want on alternate days. And then I just have to avoid food on the other days. And an eight week trial is probably not enough to hang your hat on unless you know what you're doing afterwards. So I feel like a lot of people see research like that and go, oh, this is exciting because I could lose more weight. You don't even have to track calories, which is how it's sold by a lot of intermittent fasting uh, fans. You don't even have, tr have to track calories. It's super simple. It's great for regulating your hunger, whatever. But just because it had equivalent or sometimes even slightly superior results after eight weeks, how long are you going to follow that diet for? And I think that's one of the things most people don't realize is when everyone... When everyone is making a case for their preferred diet online, everyone, lots of people are selling their preferred method. People are like, here's why you should buy an intermittent fasting book. Keto is the best diet or whatever. I feel like a lot of the research that they're using are short-term papers and people don't even realize why that is an issue. So for example, if I said to you, here is a meta-analysis showing that low-carbohydrate diets result in statistically significant more fat loss or weight loss at the six-month mark. And you'd say, okay, what's the practical significance of that over 12 months or two mm -hmm. years? And for most people, what happens at the six-month mark is irrelevant mm -hmm. because they don't care. Like, unless they want to go keto for the rest of their lives, whether they've lost a couple of extra pounds of water weight at the six-month mark is you know, what's the significance of that? Mm -hmm. And I think weight maintenance is neglected for many reasons. One, because it's more difficult to measure. It's more difficult to study. Um, two, because it's less exciting for the average person. Three, because I think it's less exciting for the marketer when people are selling diet <laughs> That's plans. That's a big one. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, literally, a magazine cover I saw... Um, that I mentioned earlier when I was checking out in the grocery store and it was literally something like lose 40 pounds in a month. Yeah. That's exciting. But if, if you had two clients and you said to one of them, you can lose 20 pounds in a month. And then the other one, you can said you can lose 20 pounds in two years. Everyone picks the first one. Yeah. Everyone picks the first one mm -hmm. because they think that they're getting to the goal quicker. Mm -hmm. If someone said you can get rich, you will always pick get rich quick if you think that that is a viable option. But when it comes to weight loss, I think what is better to explain to people is you can get rich quick, but there is a possibility that you won't still be rich two years from now. And that is what I think is missing from dieting is because everyone is focusing on getting rich quick, not realizing that 12 months from now, 24 months mm. from now, they might have lost everything that they've earned. Mm -hmm. And that to me is one of the, the kind of downfalls with dieting. We're so focused on what happens in eight weeks or 10 weeks that we completely forget that if you can't maintain it, okay. how many people diet every January, for example? Oh, I always, I get, it's the curse of going to school for nutrition 
you get a lot of the questions of like, what's the best diet? Like, how should, how should I eat? How do you eat? And my answer is always the same. It's, well, the best, the best diet is one you can adhere to. The best eating pattern is the one you can adhere to. Because do you want to diet forever? No one wants to diet forever. If you think about the standard dieting culture in America, no one, no one would want to diet forever. So it's how could you eat and continue to eat? How could you picture yourself eating two years from now? How can you picture yourself living two years from now? Simple habits that you could pick up that you would want to continue out. That does not sell. Mm -mm. That's not going to sell. Oh, my God. I, I mean, marketing companies would not enjoy me. I would not bring any sales to a brand. <laughs> Having the expectation that this worked because this worked for someone, so it's going to work for me. I think that also leads people down a really slippery slope because your life is always changing. And we're all in different environments and we all are under different stress and we all have different relationships, different learning experiences, upbringing. So how can you have this expectation that this is also going to apply to me? But I think that is why like people are very detached from how food plays such an integral role in your everyday life mm -hmm. and food and stress and all these other areas of health. Okay, and here's what I want to know about. I didn't, I didn't ask you this beforehand, so I do want to get your take on this. Because we are, we've learned this a lot through podcasting. I learned it a little bit before too. I think the best way we've ever learned something or learned about something is by having to teach someone else. When we put on a podcast, when we write an outline, maybe when you write a book, right? When you have to teach someone else, you learn more about yourself, more about the subject than you ever would have in any other metric. The process was, you said, about three years to write a book. Were there any massive shifts for you in what you thought was right versus what you now know or think to know i don't think i changed my perspective on anything in the book i evolved my perspective to include more uh data from other angles i think so as an example when i first started writing it it was actually the goal was supposed to be what i describe as the fat loss bible and possible religious connotations meant that that isn't a viable title but my original goal was almost to make it kind of textbook ish where if there's a research topic i would just talk about the research on that topic um so for example rates of weight loss here's the research on rates of weight loss here's how you can use that information one of the things that i changed is talking more about uh, body image and the motivations for why mm -hmm. um, why people want to lose weight in the first place. And that is a really important evolution for me. So when I started in the fitness industry, because I was a hardcore fitness guy, I was the guy with the six pack dieting to get into a photo shoot. I was very clinical. It was, I want to know what the research says. Here's what's optimal. That's what I'm going to do. And then I was, my social media content was very sciencey. It was, we're going to talk about this topic. Here are the research papers on that topic. And over the past few years, I realized when I talked about certain topics, you know, I say every time you post, you get a little bit of feedback. There were certain topics that when I talked about, I got a lot more feedback than I expected. And one of them was risks about being really lean. Um, and the other one was when I was empathetic to people that were struggling. Yeah. And it was surprising to me how many people were almost blown away that me the guy with the six pack was empathizing with someone who was saying that they were struggling to lose weight and I th a lot of fitness people are quite militant and unempathetic and unforgiving and if you have obesity you are someone who's lazy and they just shout at you more like just eat less and you'll lose weight and we know that it's more difficult than that and more complicated than that so as my social media following grew, and it often grew in response to certain topics that I talked about, I realized that I had to include more of that in the book. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the first chapter, Why Do You Want to Lose Weight? I think I started it off with, you might think this is an odd question to ask in a weight loss book. And my editor highlighted it and said, I think it's a great question to ask in a weight loss book. But originally, that whole chapter didn't even, it wasn't even going to be in there. Mm -hmm. It was going to be straight into, here's the research on the topics that I get asked about. And then I realized that the reason the chapter was so important is because when people want to lose weight, unless they have a why, 
you can pick the wrong path. You can pick the wrong vehicle. You think you see the destination because everyone wants to lose weight. Most people want to lose weight. But everyone who wants to lose weight has a slightly different goal or a slightly different incentive, a slightly different purpose. Whether it is someone like myself who wanted to have photos that ended up just going on social media because he had a fragile sense of self-esteem or whether it's someone who is middle-aged and they think they need to lose a few pounds because their doctor told them to and they get out of breath when they play with their grandkids and they think that maybe they should lose a few pounds to assist with that or someone else who's like I need to lose a few pounds because I used to fit in this dress when I was X years mm. old and I feel ugly and to me it's almost startling that I wouldn't have included the first chapter when I think about it with hindsight because I hate the idea that I could just talk about weight loss interventions and research topics without talking about why someone wants to lose weight in the first place without giving them the kind of psychological pep talk of are you sure this is going to make you happier? Just checking. Just make sure we're all on the same wavelength. Yeah. And I think just making sure... If you know why you're doing something, I think you can make better decisions on making sure that those decisions actually serve you. Because if the second person who wants to lose a few pounds because their doctor said so, because they think it will improve their health, if they start exercising more and they notice that their blood work is improving and their fitness is improving, they might realize that weight loss was never actually the goal. They were pursuing weight loss because they thought it would improve their fitness and improve their health markers. But they could get there without losing pound yeah so they're using weight loss as a proxy for health or happiness or whatever not realizing that weight was never actually the goal it was what they thought they would achieve when they lost that i would have honestly almost messaged you and thought something was wrong if that chapter wasn't in the book now i'm thinking about it like i was read it i was like okay this makes sense you're gonna stop here pause here check it in so it almost it kills me that almost wasn't even the book when i started three years ago it was never in Mm -hmm. i got i got over halfway through in fact if it wasn't for that chapter one of I can't remember there was another chapter maybe like the bonus research chapter this w- it would have been launched in 2022 it was one of the biggest uh, like sorry a year ago um, it was one of the biggest inclusions that pushed everything back because I realized that without that chapter the whole book was not what I wanted it to be anymore to begin with it was textbook style it was what's the best diet popular question let's answer it in detail mm-hmm. what's the best meal frequency is sugar fattening uh whatever Mm -hmm. and i was like i hate the idea that i would put that out into the world because my social media following is probably i don't even know several times the size it was when i first started writing and all of a sudden i have eyes on me from very different angles and some people to a lot of people weight loss is as you know super personal yeah Mm -hmm. and sometimes people feel insecure they think they need to lose weight because they were bullied when they were a kid or whatever and it wasn't until more of those people started coming to my page where it's like I have to have an intro I have to have something that's just uh, the conversation you would have as a good personal trainer with your client just sometimes people want to be heard and I feel like you do a really good job of doing that in a space that is very saturated by black and white this is what you do should do this is what you shouldn't kind of ignoring that People have a really hard time doing this, and there's a bigger. This is a bigger picture than people are making it out to be. It feels a little bit more safe because it's removing that element of shame because you have either failed or have done it in the past and can't do it now. I, I've got a theory with this. My theory, one of my theories, is that spokespeople in the fitness industry are people who are already very enthusiastic about fitness. They got into fitness because they enjoyed fitness. Most people don't become a personal trainer because they think they'll get rich. Mm. They enjoyed the gym and they wanted to pick a career where they would spend more time in the gym. And because of that, it's almost like the vocal minority of teachers and educators in this space are people who are only in a very small subset of what the average population is actually like. And it's almost like people who always loved exercising don't know how to communicate with people who haven't. People who are often already lean. How many people get into the fitness industry when they are, quote-unquote, in good shape, for example? 
if a young guy trains a lot and he loves training, it's a seamless transition for him to become a personal trainer. So then the person who's educating everyone else is the person that finds the gym second nature. And I don't think they always know how to empathize with people that don't find a gym second nature. Mm -hmm. And I think if you swap the industry and you pick something else, it's kind of maybe an easier parallel. It's like finding someone who is really enthusiastic about fishing, trying to tell someone that fishing is easy, but some people just don't like fishing. And it, it can be shameful when you have all these often people with six packs who love exercising, who are already training six times a week, telling the single parent who's struggling to get to the gym because they're exhausted, oh, you just need to want it hard enough. You are really like patronizing fuckhead. But it's not until they've maybe gone through that experience where they realize that they're a patronizing fuckhead. Especially in the kind of like fitness influencer side, it's like, this is, the, this is their life. Like this is what they do that's what their lives revolve around like we have to look outside of this small little bubble the small little world that you don't even live in like the, you don't live in that world where you're getting up and you're filming your life at the gym and your best glute day and what you're eating for breakfast and just going about it like this is normal it's not it's not normal there are many turning points i remember one turning point and i had a conversation with a friend of mine one of my best mates and he he had been training. He'd just got into the gym. He hadn't trained in years. He was he was he was picking up steam. He was progressing. He was enjoying it. And he was like, I'm getting stronger at this, getting stronger at this. He was enjoying it. And I remember seeing him one day and I was like, You you've progressed so much in the gym. Like he was doing more pull ups than he's ever been able to do. He was lifting more weight than he's ever been able to do. And he said, My arms are still not as big as yours. And I was like, Correct. Hmm. This is my full-time job and I've been doing this for over a decade and he looked at me as a source of inspiration and that was an odd moment for me I was self-employed no kids financially probably more stable than most going to the gym whenever I fancied I would wake up I used to move my clients to facilitate my workouts because I enjoyed training so I went to see clients at 10 a.m. because that's what time I want to train. It was super easy for me. I already worked in a gym, so it would take me two minutes to finish with a client, start my workout. He was talking to me about his day. He said to me he used to wake up before 6 a.m. He had a long drive to work where he would work a long day. There was not a gym on site, so it wasn't like he could squeeze it in on, on his lunch break easily. Then he would have a long drive home would get home late and feel exhausted. But when he got home, he had a policy that he would always make sure he put his kids to bed. So he would go home, spend some time with his wife, put his kids to bed, read his kids a bedtime story. And he said to me, I go to the gym after I've been lying down with my daughter next to me in her bed in a dark room while she nods off. And it's 9 p.m., I think he said. And he would drag himself to the gym and he'd been up since six a since before six AM and he was looking at me as a source of inspiration and I was like Yeah. Bro. Too different. <laughs> bro. They're not mm -hmm. even comparable. He was doing so much more with his life. He had so much more to juggle and he was looking at me like, Oh, he's got bigger arms than me and it's mm -hmm. like I've got fucking nothing else in my life. Like I feel like you're looking at this uh, the wrong way. I get asked a lot, like, how do I could never be on social media so much like also in a space where other people are doing what you do I would constantly compare myself the second that I started to change my mindset to comparing myself to myself a year ago it was like blinders because it's the only productive thing to do having getting knowledge from other people getting insight from people who are doing what you do is, is so important and could add so much value but if you enter that from a point of comparison the self-doubt will get you. So you can still have goals. You can still find people that inspire you and could teach you. But what? who are you comparing yourself to that's motivating these goals? That's there's always a piece of comparison that I think people miss. And the best, it kind of clicked a little light bulb in my head when someone told it to me like this. It's like, in, I'll just use your scenario just for a good example. 
if someone always likes to like isolate and pick one piece and compare, you know, I want this piece of their life and this piece of that person's life and this piece of that. And it's like, we can't just isolate. Like you can't have one. It's like, would you trade every single thing in your life for every single thing in that person's life? Your arms, for example. I feel like both of you guys in that scenario, he probably wouldn't want to trade his entire family, his career. He wouldn't want to trade all that for bigger arms. Like you wouldn't want to trade slightly smaller arms for a family, a little less flexible. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you can't just isolate and pick from the best hundred people in the world. That just doesn't make sense. Mm. And I don't think people see it like that, right? They like to isolate and say, you know, this person has the best insert body part here. I want that. And unless I do, I'm not going to be pumped about myself. And I it, feel like that's especially risky when you're looking on social media for people yeah. who work in the fitness industry. Mm. It's like, it's looking at someone for the thing that they specialize in. Someone who makes a career from selling workout programs and they're selling workout programs by posting videos of themselves topless or scantily clad or whatever, um, that's their wheelhouse, that's their skill set. And other people looking in like, I want to look like them, it's, it's comparing to the highlight reel. Mm -hmm. And going back to something you said earlier, like, do your clients, do they say to you, do you feel pressure to be in that space? Mm -hmm. I, I read an interesting research paper that talked about personal trainers having worse body image. And the theory is there is a pressure on fitness professionals to look a certain way because clients expect them to look a certain mm -hmm. way. So personal trainers will often get into the industry, feel an external pressure for them to change the way they look because they are their business card for their clients. So they feel worse about themselves. They put more emphasis on changing the way they look. And other people are looking in, seeing the way they look, going, I want to look like that. Not realizing that part of the reason they look like that is often fueled from an insecurity to begin with. And that was the same with me. When I started in the fitness industry, I was far more secure with how I looked than when I was in the fitness industry. And when I was there, suddenly there were eyes on me. And... I wanted to look a certain way. It was better for picking up clients. Then I started on social media and I was getting insults from strangers about how I looked. Like, this body part isn't muscular enough. I, I shit you not, someone once sent me a screenshot of one of my photos and they had drawn an arrow <laughs> to my wrist. And I promise you, they said, your wrists are so slim, some of your clients might be put off training with you. I would encourage you to change your profile photo. So Honestly, I'm not that surprised. My jaw's dropping, but I'm not yeah. that surprised. I mean... And I've had uh, countless people that will write messages on YouTube saying you need to train your neck, your neck's too slim, or your chest is underdeveloped, or your traps are under underdeveloped, or your legs are underdeveloped. There's so much pressure for fitness people to look a certain way, especially when you're on social media, that I don't think we can blame fitness people for kind of feeding mm -mm. into that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like blaming cosmetic surgery on celebrities when celebrities are under the spotlight from people that are constantly criticizing. When when celebrities are being put up in social on uh, in magazines or on the media every time they gain a few pounds or every time a woman has cellulite, should we be surprised when they end up going to cosmetic surgery? I feel like it's often an outside pressure that fuels them to change the way they look. I notice that a lot, especially like with just weight loss if people are so pressured, they get the negative comments, like you should lose weight, you do it, and then it's, what well, was that healthy? Did you do that in a healthy way? Like, are you too thin? Is this person losing weight too fast? Especially when you think about like celebrities, it's like they'll get photographed being overweight and then all of a sudden they lose the weight and now they're underweight and there's a reason to worry. Like, I hope they're okay. The lengths that some people will go through, like the drawing and the screenshotting, it's like, well, wait, a how much time did you take to, <laughs> to do this? I'm like, it's kind of impressive that you'd, that you'd spend so much time looking at me for that. That's always kind of funny to me. Do you want to wrap this up before the two mark? Yeah, I think we can wrap it, okay. wrap it up. Do we want to touch on anything else? No, I think Ben can let everyone know where to find you if they're not following you already. Any resources, any places you want to point them? Did you start, like, write a book or something? I don't know. <laughs> I just wrote a book or something. <laughs> I did write a book. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Do you still um, have like? Was it kind of like a fever dream? Still kind of having. Not sure if it's real. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it still feels surreal. Um, if if anyone wants to follow me on social media, they can follow me on Instagram or TikTok. The same handle, BBC Carpenter. 
And if they like me at some point, they may want to buy my book, but I will not be shoving it down their face. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think especially in reading through the book, I, I, I don't even know if we touched on this. I, I feel like we touched on a lot of things. There's well, just because you have to really explore to really get like an understanding of something. Like when you get obsessive with something, you really want to understand it. Like you have to kind of find every single dead end to truly be competent in that, right? You can't leave anything like, oh, I think that's right, but I'll just trust that later. If you really want a firm understanding, I think you did a really good job in each piece of the book. Because some of the chapters were longer than I would have expected with the question, but it makes sense when you actually read and break down. Because it is, it's covering each of the, the dead ends that people's brains might not naturally hit, but would eventually, eventually just end up going to if weren't covered. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say, if you really want, like if, it, if you're someone who does crave the understanding, like the total just confidence in that. I had, uh, there's like actually a reason for that. So my theory, uh, pick like, pick any popular fitness myth. Carbs are, carbs oh. will make you fat. Okay. So my theory is say something like carbs will make you fat. There are almost like two band camps, people that are pro-carbs, people that are anti-carbs. And I feel like sometimes people in the pro-carb or the anti-carb camp are dismissive of the other camp to the point that no one ever changes their mind. Just a wall between two sides. Yeah. Carbs are good, carbs are bad, rah, 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 no one moves. Mm. My personal belief is that it's easier to change someone's mind if you explain and show them how well you know their side, not your own side. I feel like someone who is pro-keto doesn't change their mind because you say keto shit. Mm. they change their mind because you say here are the reasons that you might love keto and they're like those are all the reasons i love keto and then you say however and you can give them a different perspective but i feel like it's more gentle than this kind of like shouting match so when i talk about research part of the reason i do it on a kind of like windy story road is because i want people to have their bases covered when they read something that changes their view mm. so if carbs are fattening, for example, if a keto person reads one research paper and they're like, this is pro my stance, I like this one. But when the keto person only reads re keto research papers and then they read one bad one, it's almost, it's kind of easy to like um, dismiss it. Mm. And the way I have kind of worded it was, here are some of the pros and here are some of the cons. And that way, hopefully, people should never be shocked. People who are pro-carb won't be shocked to know there are some research papers that show that low-carb diets are better for weight loss, for example. They won't go, oh, but I thought that carbs were great. Like, I don't understand. Because I've said, here is some research that is actually contradicting what you might believe. But here is why it probably doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And my idea is, if you give people like, both sides of the argument they won't feel rocked when someone presents them with a side that contradicted them mm. that's my theory but yeah it's like if you can't make a better argument for the person who you're talking against it's like you might not be ready to even change their mind yeah. right like that's kind of your, your preface on it. like if you can't build a better argument for them get them to see that then change perspectives or highlight pieces that might be missing they could never understand it like chapter eight for example chapter eight is broken up into like um, macronutrients, meal timing, food focus, dietary flexibility, all of those have different subsections, high protein, low carb, low fat, etc. That entire section could be summarized as there is no best weight loss diet. Like for the summary, it's a, an unnecessarily long chapter, <laughs> but someone who reads it who is pro low carb or pro intermittent fasting should hopefully read it and go, ah, oh, didn't realize that quite clear that he has shown the research that i thought existed like here's all the research that i believe here's the research that my my uh pro intermittent fasting person has been shoving down my throat but here's the research that i didn't realize exist existed and he still tells me that there might be benefits i might like it for appetite regulation mm -hmm. i like the way i feel or whatever but it's showing people both sides laying your cards out on the table and saying do without what you will. Absolutely. So that's where it is. I was like, okay. I don't even know if we said the name of the book this entire time. Yeah. Everything fat loss. Yeah. 
Everything fat loss. <laughs> but it's on your profiles, too. I was going to say, we can't recommend enough to follow on social media. I think that's where people will gain so much freaking education. That's where they can find the book if they ever want to. So we're going to wrap this up. We're going to maybe take go take a, another ice bath real no quick. More. Get out. I j- I'm not joking. About 20 minutes ago, I just got was like, okay, I feel warm now. It was about <laughs> it was not until 20 minutes ago. <laughs> another ice bath real quick. Go to dinner or something like that. And have Thank a day. you for coming. Thanks very much for having me on. Thank of course. You for Woo! <laughs>